uh, in a minute or so, I'll hand it off to Patricia, but just for a quick introduction, my name is Jen Cacciola. I'm the co-founder of Ice Cream Social. And um, this exhibition was in partnership with MapSpace, which Patricia Miranda is the founder of. And we can mention, then we'll repeat it at the end. Um, so this show closes next Saturday, or rather this upcoming Saturday is the last day to view it. And then we'll have another show um, in collaboration with MapSpace opening December 2nd. And that'll be a solo show, um, work by Margaret Pinto, who's currently um, an ice cream social resident at MapSpace. Yeah, very excited about that. So the opening is on December 2nd from three to five. <clears throat> And then we'll all en masse go to an opening at Gallery 06870 in Old Greenwich. They're having a, a big show. So if you're in the area, definitely should be a fun, a fun uh, day. Yeah. All right. Do you want to, shall we? Yeah, I think. Okay. Um, all right. So welcome, everyone. Very excited to be here with you and to be here with these incredible artists for this beautiful, beautiful show. Uh, I am Patricia Miranda. I am the founder of, uh, I'm an artist and educator and curator and founder of the Crit Lab and also MapSpace, which is um, an art space that's been around for quite some time. It's artist-owned, artist-driven space for curatorial expl exploration, exhibition, collaboration, and the gathering of ideas across discipline, philosophy, and art form. We are always interested in collaboration. We're always interested in community-oriented projects. We've done residencies. We've had uh, micro-grant dinners. We've done all kinds of really um, fun things. And so it was a particular thrill to collaborate with Jen Cacciola of Ice Cream Social because we're, we're sort of very very sort of similarly minded in our attitude about community oriented art spaces and also artist run culture, artists making opportunities for themselves and for other artists. We're really committed to that at MapSpace. So I'm um, just really excited to be here and to hear uh, the show is incredibly beautiful. And I was uh, very thrilled to meet some of the artists at the opening and I'm happy to hear the artists who weren't able to be there speak about their work tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to Jen. Just want to thank you all for this amazing show. It's been incredible. Um, and hopefully you'll stay in touch with us at MapSpace and we'll con we can continue to work together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patricia. Um, and a little bit of context besides just loving working with Patricia. <laughs> um, Ice Cream Social used to have a physical space um, also located in Port Chester. Uh, with studios and exhibition space. Um, unfortunately, we no longer have that space as of very, very recently. And we're in the process of looking for a permanent home again in Port Chester. But in the meantime, all of our shows that were on the calendar are very generously being hosted at fellow art spaces like Map Space um, throughout the tri-state area. So we will have um, further shows coming down the line um, and the next one, like I mentioned, will again be at Map Space. Um, so I, I think I'll start us off just by reading the first two sentences from the text of the exhibition, which is titled A Pot Nudged Into Oblivion. Um, in this exhibition, eight artists handle modes of fear and fragility while either upholding or peeling away facades of fortitude. Mechanisms of warning are scratched, punched, scrawled, and lovingly arranged. Um, and so this is this talk is by no means an in-depth view of each artist's practice, but rather uh, just a small window into what they're thinking about in relation to the themes of the show specifically. Um, when I'm curating, I, I really enjoy bringing a wide variety of approaches to the same central idea together in one space. Um, and so I just think of this as a little buffet line. Um, and I think artists love finding out how other artists are solving the same problems that they're having in the studio. So really, this is just a survey intro to everyone's work. And I encourage you all to get in touch and maybe do a studio visit and find out more about each artist in depth after this. Um, come to this the is show. also, oh yes, also come to the show before Saturday. And yes. there's also <laughs> images on, there's images online as well, so. 
Yes, and, and we'll have a few install shots in the slideshow. Um, this is also the largest artist panel we've ever done. <laughs> um, so we have so, so much to get through. Uh, if you have questions at any point, leave them in the chat. We will be monitoring it. Um, and then if there's any time at the end, we'll try to squeeze a few in. Um, okay, so let me... Um, oh, screen share. We're going to start with um, just a few, a uh, couple of sentences, really, really brief intro um, by each artist about their work. Um, and then we're going to move into some of the sub themes within the show and look at some past work by each artist as well. Um, so here are some install shots. So the show encompasses everything from large scale oil painting, collage works, um, site specific installations, uh, sculptures. So it's also pretty wide ranging in terms of mediums represented. And this is also introduction to the beautiful map space. Okay, so Annika, do you mind starting us off with just a very brief general introduction to um, your practice? Sure, hi, I'm Annika. Uh, I'm based in Midcoast, Maine, and I mostly make drawings and I use the language of fairy tales to talk about contemporary feminist issues. So much. Shabnan, do you mind taking it over? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shabnam. I am um, usually painting uh, myself, my family, and my friends. Uh, uh, my Most of uh, my painting is about uh, the life I left behind in Iran. I am from Iran. And uh, so, yeah. I guess. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get into all that juicy stuff in a bit. <laughs> Elena. Um, hey, I'm Elena. Um, kind of just like Shabna mentioned, I'm uh, kind of grappling with um, the life I left behind in Russia, though. Um, my practice is mostly conceptual and I deal with memory, weaponization of memory. Thank you. Also, I just want to double check. Everyone can see my screen sharing the slides of images, right? Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, Sara. Hi, um, I was also born in Iran. Um, I'm an Iranian American who was raised in the United States. Um, I live and work in Brooklyn. I'm primarily an abstract painter who works in acrylic. Um, I tend to work with light washes of acrylic paint, and at times I combine it with spray paint, charcoal, and thread. Beautiful. Marielle. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from Long Island and I'm currently pursuing a BFA at SUNY Purchase, which is not far from the gallery. Um, and uh, I focus on some on sculptural work about, um, right now I'm exploring um, trans masculinity and neurodivergence um, by, uh, I, I like to choose objects and kind of expand on their meaning and queer them. I'm interested in queering the objects to mm -hmm. kind of talk about uh, these things. Thank you. Anna. Uh, I work mainly in mixed media collage painting, uh, using a lot of recycled papers and destroying things and putting them back together. So a lot of my work in uh, the material and subject matter has to do with diasporic culture, specifically as it relates to my family's Jewish history, uh, and also just have a big visual interest in pattern and architecture. And you're based in New York City, right? Mm -hmm. In Brooklyn. Jen. Um, hi, my name is Jen. I am based in Rochester, New York, uh, though I'm from Italy originally. Um, kind of a mixed media conceptual artist working a lot with the idea of 
um, labor, labor on display, um, kind of unusual materials and um, really kind of what it means to be something and then be something else. I love that you put it that way. <laughs> Cynthia, take it away. Hi, I'm Cynthia Reynolds. Uh, I was born and raised in Kentucky. Uh, now I live in New York City. Um, I've had a long-term relationship with packing materials. Their spaces are really interesting to me, their meanings as a really well-known functional object. So I tend to go back and forth between working directly with them and molding and casting them in other materials. Um, and I... The ones that I use directly, I rely on exclusively things that I find by happenstance uh, on my regular travels around the city. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Cynthia, I am going to have you lead us into the first uh, sort of thematic subtopic. Um, okay. So we are going to be dividing this idea of modes of fear and acts of preservation first into materials as preservation, as speaking, as methods of speaking about the act of preservation um, and how each of you think about material, specifically material um, engaging in the act of preservation. And then we'll kind of move into I, broader ideas of cultural preservation, um, generational preservation of information. Um, so Cynthia, um, can you maybe using these previous works, explain your ideas when you're in the studio, how you're thinking about the act of preservation? Well, so the image on the left, which is expanded polystyrene, uh, it's commonly referred to as bead foam. And it's basically composed of those little spheres. And I'm sure you've interacted with it frequently. Um, so you know i found these three at the same time and so for me they describe a single space uh so i picked away the extra foam everything that wasn't defining the limits of the original piece and then this is shown open but then closed is how i prefer it so you kind of have to peek between them um you know, that material, this foam is going to outlast all of us. So I'm really interested in the idea that it had a very ephemeral period of usefulness um, to get something to its destination. And now it's just sort of taking up that space for like 500 years. Um, so I'm kind of reframing that space as something that I can control um, and, you know, it sort of moves around and claims the same amount of space that was originally taken kind of out of circulation in order for this thing that is no longer present to get to its destination safely. And then on the right, um, these are, so the pieces on the outer edge of the triptych are porcelain castings of the outside surface of packing material. So it's sort of like a skin. I think of these in terms of drawings, like a description of the surface. Mm. And then the in the middle are gl cast glass pieces that were made by shooting hot wax into the actual packaging and then using the lost wax process. So these are very much physical artifacts of the spaces that had been used for packaging. And they're created in what are very fragile materials, but they're also very uh, resilient and often associated with things that you find from past civilizations. So I find that interesting in terms of these sort of wasted spaces um, as a comment on our on on the idea that there's somewhere that things can just go that are no longer taking up space that could be used in another way. Yeah, and the act of casting specifically is such an act of like the effort to preserve in exactitude. Exactly. I mean, it's sort of like the whole, you know, like those things that are preserved in amber, like that is a thing that, you know, casting 
um, is a very particular time. It captures a particular point in the life of this packaging, mm -hmm. um, but then it renders it in a material that has other associations of it own, of its own. So it's kind of the combination of those two um, ideas. Yeah. Um, and then kind of, oh, sorry. Oh no. Um, and then kind of on a, on, in the idea of personal preservation is how I read these works where you're thinking about exploration of the female body. Yeah. Can you talk about- Well, like, so, so my like initial attraction to packaging um, the image on the right is from my graduate school work and it was kind of the first stuff that I made where I really felt like I had found my voice like it, it felt sort of undeniable to me these are life-size sort of pinch pots that the mm -hmm. clay is the color those are like Idaho and Oregon clays I was in Washington state at the time and I was really interested in only the um area outside the biologically necessary body, sort of like the packaging of the body, although I wasn't necessarily thinking of it in those terms at that time, but I was uh, thinking of it as in terms of a vessel, sort of something that, that existed and carried the body. And so um, I had a sort of mental health collapse at the end of my graduate program. And so these two pieces represent right before that and right after that, um, oh the the extra part of my body, once I was feeling very fragile, you know, they look very similar, but they were, it's sort of, um, I was still in that space outside of my, working outside the body, working with the vessel, but now it was much more about trying to protect myself, feeling incredibly mm -hmm. fragile um, and really giving another kind of voice to what I had been saying about the fat female body. Uh, there was a lot of feminist overtones in what I was doing in graduate school. And I really feel like the packing materials are, I think of them as feminine spaces. They protect <laughs> um, and they are ignored. And um, so it, this was a really important, like, crucial transition for me even it was a really long time ago but it sort of set me on the path to um where I am now in terms of thinking about the space of the body the space of architecture and how those things uh relate to each other and relate to sort of where I started my journey as an artist yeah absolutely thank you um oh. Oh, I skipped it. Um, that's some more of my stuff. <laughs> I know that's more of your stuff. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, let me move to uh, Marielle. Can you? Thank you, Cynthia. By the way, <laughs> sorry, we're so tight. Um, Marielle, can you uh, kind of expand in the same way you're you're using material in a way to serve the purpose of self-preservation uh, but specifically you're thinking about your identity in context of maybe s structures that don't support that kind of visibility right uh, yeah um yeah i uh i'm kind of i feel like the you know the way that the system that we're in and like the constructs that make it up um don't uh kind of innately like support and don't support and obscure um like neurodivergence and transmasculinity mm -hmm. um and kind of uh yeah <laughs> um Can so you walk us through the maybe starting from this piece in particular leak yeah. which is part of the show yeah so um i I kind of just like to use objects in general and um, cause I feel like they uh, represent a system in some way. These like kind of like very like familiar objects. So the punching bag here um, was, I kind of subverted it to be an allegory for vulnerability by, um, uh, can't really see in the picture, but um, that the piece of fabric hanging off of it has the embroidery, the embroidery is, it has a, some embroidery that 
um, is supposed to look like uh, an anus. So that's like a body part that's like very like vulnerable and kind of emulates this vulnerability. Um, also, so you mentioned gender like, neutral. Yeah, it's a uh, it's uh, kind of you know I this I mean this piece is about like trans masculinity and kind of like the tension I feel mm -hmm. there it's like I feel very vulnerable as a trans masculine person and so the um the anus kind of emulates that and um you know that would have been you know that's like in contrast to like you know like male genitalia which is you know I feel mm -hmm. like um I wanted to choose something that's more gender neutral um and a bit more complex um yeah than and this object of the punching bag. Um, that's an idea I've heard you talk about in the past of male aggression and addressing ideas about male aggression through the objects that you're choosing. Yeah, yeah it's um, uh, kind of putting it in this, uh, um, putting this body part on this vessel is kind of exposing it to um, aggression in this way and um, mm -hmm. uh, there's like this um, there there's this kind of like fear of a math of like a masculine that I feel as a trans masculine mm -hmm. person that is also like a problematic like male machismo fear mm -hmm. uh, and so kind of um, exploring that uh, tension. It's like, I fear being emasculated because I'm like, I feel very vulnerable and mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, there's a parallel between that and. Yeah, so using, using a constant shifting between things that are um, more aggressive and more vulnerable, constantly shifting between those two things um, as a way of preservation, but it's the opposite of what we think about when we think about preservation, which is normally to close. Instead, mm -hmm. you're using this opening and exposing um, gesture as an act of preservation because um, because you're doing it in the context of this conversation of suppression. So mm. within that context, being vulnerable and being exposed perhaps is actually preservation, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, using this object that would normally be about just like catharsis and very like, mm -hmm. like male culture and putting it through, through this lens mm -hmm. um I I don't know I like I, for me like changing the meaning of an object or expanding on its meaning um is like is a way of kind of like creating this new this this language around it or and kind of like preserving um that uh mm -hmm. yeah um like that sense, the internal sense of duality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mario. Um, Shabnan, uh, can you talk about specifically the, the sense of material in your work? So I pulled this, this is an older work. Um, it's not part of the show. Um, your large scale, beautiful, oil paintings are in the show, but this is using a similar um, hand toward pattern, which you've said is really crucial to your images. Can you talk about um, specifically how you think about color and pattern in in the narrative? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, that's a really interesting piece that you pulled up because this piece is actually one of the first piece that I started to bring those colors and those pattern uh, in, into my body of work. Um, uh, so, uh, so like for me, uh, 
it kind of like visual sources and research that I use are deeply you, uh, rooted uh, in my personal memories and uh, my experience uh, experiences, particularly my childhood memories of uh, this specific colorful carpet in my grandparents' um, home. Uh, so, like, uh, mm, this carpet uh, serves as a significant source of uh, inspiration for my work. Uh, the memories associated with the carpet, such, a, uh, such as playing on it with my cousin or, um, or uh, remembering my mother's happiness as she cooked with her family, uh, are very important for me and um, so I kind of like since I uh, moved to America and I keep uh, I kept talking with my uh, mom and I kept looking at those photos and in all of the photos like you can see like all of the those colors all of those uh, patterns and carpet and food and everything all the color so I uh, I try to use these kind of memories as a primary so, uh, source because they provide this strong emotional and personal connection uh, to the colors, pattern, and texture that I incorporate into uh, my paintings. So uh, so I can say that like. Uh, mm, uh, the colorful, uh, like these, such, uh, like my my palette is inspired by these memories and especially, uh, and especially like you know, this specific carpet uh, uh, of my uh, grandparents, and uh, yeah, I also uh, like. Uh, want to make like using this pattern and color and everything to um, create uh, this alternative reality for these women where they can exist uh, uh, freely in kind of like this dream like uh, atmosphere uh, in my painting um yeah, and sometimes you're also, so you're you're using the this visual language as a way of preserving memory, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing it with you and having memory transported across place and time to travel with totally. you. And also sometimes you're incorporating objects liter in a literal sense into the paintings. Um, I don't know if it's very clear to everyone from the photo, but the it's a object incorporated into this painting that that your grandmother is holding and this is one of the paintings of the show too right right yeah i i yeah i i use the colors and pattern and include this object so like i when i moved i immigrant from iran so i try to have like some of like uh, bring some object from everyone and i choose to bring this specific object from my grand uh, grandma to here and then like when I uh, painted her I uh, I, I just uh, attached this object to uh, to this painting um, just what as a memory the object in case for all of us including myself who don't know <laughs> it's it's I don't think it's it's very specific. I I was just playing as a kid with this object, and it, I I know it was uh, belonged to my grandma, and nothing inside it. <laughs> Unfortunately, no coins. <laughs> Thank no you. Coins. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hannah, so you're also um, you're also using specifically. Um, the language of textiles at times, um, but more broadly, objects that belong to the familial ephemera. And can you talk about how, what kind of place those, what role they play in the work yeah. and how you're thinking about um, it? And first I'll say that these photos aren't great because I did actually have my grandmother send them to me a couple days ago. 
Um, That's even and, better. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I think a, a lot of, I guess I'll start with visual inspiration. Um, the body of work that I put in this show is very much drawing on the language of textiles and not so directly specifically to these, but I think that's where a lot of my thinking comes from in um, depicting objects that are in the home and objects that preserve culture, uh, travel with people from place to place. Um, and there's also, I mean, the idea of textiles is like a literal thread that ties you to people, I think is super interesting. And in my work, I do think also like Shabnam, a lot about connection between time and place um, and kind of histories and stories, finding new places, um, yeah. drawing upon our ancestors' histories. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about Jewish needlepoint? Like I didn't know about this whole genre yeah, <laughs> at all. <laughs> I guess it's a, a common hobby or practice among old Jewish women. Um, unfortunately, it was not passed down to me or oh, my, no. my sister or my mother. <laughs> But my, my grandmother was not a teacher. Well, she actually was a teacher. She was a kindergarten teacher, but she didn't teach my mom to cook. She didn't teach her how to do needlepoint. Um, she <laughs> is a very, she does her own thing. Um, but yeah, both of my grandmothers have done needlepoint. And the stool on the right, actually, so that was my grandmother's grandmother's stool. And when her grandmother passed away, her mother refurbished it and needle point um by needlepoint made the cover on it and then now it's in my grandmother's home That's so amazing. it's like very much about intergenerational connection like an intergenerational efforts to salvage too yeah. because even though you weren't passed down the the technique of this here you are salvaging it in your own way yeah, and I don't want to get too ahead because I, I know right. you're going to want to talk about <laughs> some of this later. And I, I think some of this relates to humor too about, yes. um, yeah. like I'll go in later, but some of the ways in which my own family has salvaged tradition. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah. And so this is one of the pieces in the show. Um, also talking about materials, you mentioned your grandmother mails you these magazines <laughs> that end yeah, up so in your... <laughs> yeah, I worked with recycled papers and magazines for a long time. And most of the time I'm actually obscuring the images and colors and I'm picking materials more for their colors and patterns than for the content. Uh, so I was never super intentional about what I was using. And I still wouldn't say I am, but it is a, like an interesting layer that my, my grandmother knew I did that. So now she actually likes to go through the magazines and pick scraps that she'll think I'll like and, and she sends them to me in the mail every few months <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are actually like Jewish feminist magazines and things like that so it is it is an, another interesting layer plus AARP you said yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's apparently some good visual stuff in those <laughs> yeah. oh my god amazing um thank you Hannah um Annika, so you're coming at this, I mean, this work, your work is still pulling from personal experience, but it seems like you create a little bit of distance um, when you're placing these objects visually, like within a, a timeline that's separated from your own, right? You're using a lot of inspiration that's like 15th, 16th century. You can speak more about it, but um, so you're, it, I, for me, it creates a little bit of a distance and, and wonderment around these objects. Can you speak to that sense of time that you're trying to create as it relates to preservation? Um, yes, <clears throat> I think a lot, I mentioned, I think a lot about fairy tales and fairy tales are, I grew up in Switzerland and fairy tales there were often used to, um, like pass down or like prepare young women for marriage essentially like beauty and the beast was to prepare women for arranged marriage um and so i think a lot about what those images look like and like the the objects that are used in fairy tales and uh how those are also the objects that i use in my kitchen today um and 
I, I think a lot about, um, I want my work to not feel so new. Like I, I want it to be believable in the context of fairy tales, but it's kind of a tricky, like, I don't want to be too nostalgic and too like, mm -hmm. uh, what is the word pastiche of a fairy tale, but I also, or like illustrations by Ivan Bilibin. He's a very famous Russian fairy tale illustrator or Arthur Rackham, who's British or American. I can't remember. Um, they're like, very well known. Um, and I want my work to sort of line up with that golden age of illustration, um, but still have a firm footing in the contemporary. So the the black and white drawing you showed, um, I'm playing with that a lot where there's like some vintage antique kind of thing, but then there's also like battery operated flashlights. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to mess up the timeline a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. These are so gorgeous and also have, I, we're going to get into ideas of humor um, more later, but I, I'm totally seeing like, you know, vague touches on horror that you're talking about crossing through and um, garish and masks and all those kinds of things. Um, and the positioning of the female within the storyline. Um, I, I'm just going to jump in for a quick sec because it's funny. The the yeah. illustrations before the witch on the right, Bobby, a guy, still used as yeah. a, like a thread to children because my friend was telling me a couple of days ago that she tells her, she's telling Russia that she tells to her kid if she, if he doesn't brush his teeth, she'll come. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, this one on the right is she's still yeah. around. She's <laughs> around. Yeah, yeah. Fierce. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Um, thank you, Zara. Um, so in contrast from Annika's sort of use of something very particular um, to be referential of broader ideas, you're kind of working in the opposite way where you're trying to, you know, peel away things and leave some ambiguity in order to talk about the um, the social ideas that are backing the work. Can you talk a little bit about your use of materials and ephemerality? Sure. Um, so I would say on a surface level, my paintings are very much about creating images that are aesthetic and, you know, that are kind of, so, you know, pretty pictures. Um, but underneath it all, what I'm most concerned about is, are creating images about what's left unsaid. Um, I think when I first started painting like this, um, I kind of imagined that my canvas as being like a blank line, like lines of paper. Mm -hmm. um, so I always start off with this network of very closely spaced horizontal or vertical lines as my starting point. Um, and then from there, I kind of build up on it. And I work in this very obsessive, detail-oriented way. Um, so I think similarly to Chabnon, I think... Um, my work is also very interested in it, it kind of it comes because I am Iranian it, it does kind of come from this like background of being around rugs and carpets um and one of the comments that I've gotten and I think people have said this to me repeatedly and then they kind of take it back because they think I'd be offended is that my work looks like tapestry like oh mm -hmm. you should put it on on a carpet which I actually really like I I, I see that as like the best um compliment ever um because I too grew up with a lot of um, Persian rugs. It was kind of integral to my culture. Um, and it wasn't so much that it was decorative, but I think the Persian rug is something that you sit on and mm -hmm. life and life happens um, on it. So I, I have the, the weaving um, element in my work, but um, I also have traveled extensively in Morocco and I lived in Mexico for quite a long time. So I think like Moroccan culture and um, also the weaving that comes out of Chiapas, um, the, some of the colors, not necessarily in this one, um, but some of the colors are very, like the pops of fluorescent colors are something that you see in, um, for example, Berber carpets. Mm. So what I, so once I do these, um, these lines, I then kind of go on with like little bits of metallic and fluorescent colors and, um, I think my paintings are also about time passing because they change depending on the light. Like they look very different in 
map space, um, for example, which I thought was really interesting compared to what they look like in my studio or when I photograph them. Um, so that's an element too. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Jen, so you have some interesting ideas about what you call the theatrics of preservation um, and what's implied in terms of the value of objects um, in terms of how they get preserved. Can you speak a little bit about that using, um, so this is also a previous work by Jen Shoemaker. Um, can you speak a bit about preservation and, and in a material sense? Um, sure. So, I mean, one of the interesting things about preservation, I guess for me, is it feels very much like a stop clock, you know, so it's this idea of kind of taking something and freezing it and then repeating that and then repeating the understanding of it over and over and over. So it's really interesting because I feel like um, time and image can kind of be stretched out indefinitely because it's the understanding of it and the weight of it and the symbolism of it is something that is handed down with the image of the object, right? So it becomes this kind of stretched thing. Um, in these pieces, um, I mean, this wasn't directly having to do with preservation, although it there it's like a double preserved object. Um, one bag is uh, pit bull remains and the other bag is Rottweiler remains with uh, marshmallow dust and plastic, right? Um, <laughs> So like really, um, really thinking about the idea of like specific animals um, being kind of floating in between individuality and non-individuality, like um, a pit bull or a Rottweiler, they're all, you know, they're often seen as like extensions of power, extensions of object, extensions of property, extensions of people. Um, but then they kind of float in between this space where they become almost individual and then they disappear again to become an extension. Um, and I really like this kind of in between preserved space, like a bag of Lucky Charms is a singular bag forever, right? It's just the box and the cereal that's being replaced over and over and over again, but it's thought of as the same Lucky Charms. And then you have um, the way that we Kind of hold these animals or understand these animals like a, a pit bulls replaced with a pit bulls replaced with a pit bull um and there's something kind of really vibratory sad a little violent about that like constant erasure that happens in service of like the nowness of something mm -hmm. yeah absolutely beautiful though <laughs> and so can you talk about a little more about the process that you use of fabrication of objects yeah, because uh, that's the thing that's always like confounding everybody <laughs> yeah um so so a lot of these have to do um I worked with I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna be a vet and I was an animal rehabber for a really long time um so I would often get animals from dog fights and medically rehab them emotionally rehab them as much as possible and rehome them and and that's, you know, basically how I spent my younger life with, we did it as a family. Um, so both of these dogs, um, I had cremated, both of them were like too sick to kind of move on, but they were um, like my personal compa companions. They stayed with me because they were too unwell to kind of continue on to a home. Um, so both of these dogs I had cremated and I carried them around with me for years. Um and, and what they are basically is like the pulverized remains um, that are set and kind of condensed in these metal molds. Um, so they're held like they'll degrade over time and they'll start to fall apart over time. Um, the same with the marshmallows, except that I ground down an unbelievable amount of marshmallows from Lucky Charms and <laughs> dusted the insides of the molds. So like you can what? break a marshmallow open and it'll be like gray inside basically. And that also, I assume, because one of the works in the show, the twig smells of sap, even though it's not originating from the object itself that's in the gallery. And I assume these smell marshmallowy. I, you know, <laughs> they, I mean, I feel like they probably don't anymore, but when I first exhibited them, people thought that they were like full marshmallows. <laughs> Crazy. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Um, Elena, so Elena, your 
Um, also sort of thinking about, I think you're thinking about fear in a much more particular way than perhaps most of the artists on here. Um, but in equal measure, thinking about preservation acts that maybe communities and families are able to do or are not able to do based on the structure around them. Um, can you talk a bit about um, like how you think about preservation um, and you talk a lot about like numbing and being silenced and things like that, engaging with the act of preservation. Um, yeah, definitely. I just wanted to tell Jen that I was one of the people who smelled and tried to smell the twig. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I hope it lasts. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, mostly like when it comes to, I think like fear and preservation, they kind of tangled um, in my work. So uh, I, mostly when it comes to preservation, um, I think what I'm trying to kind of preserve archive maybe like preserve archive mm -hmm. it was also kind of the sort of preservation's memory um and not only personal memories kind of generational memories that are passed on but also like what memories put out there in public spaces means of propaganda too and kind of planted for us and uh we kind of like swallow them and we think that oh these are my these are my personal memories but are they mm -hmm. actually so kind of that um entanglement of personal and uh what is imposed on us and weaponized and when it comes to fear i think sometimes i'm quite literally try to preserve the language mm -hmm. um that comes out of fear um because of just growing up with the censorship that was unfolding more and more and um just overall that memory of censorship that is also generational memory for my parents and their parents um that kicked in very fast when the current dictatorship kind of like unfolded completely um mm -hmm. so my train of thought what was this in the language yes yeah <laughs> so yeah, I, th I think sometimes there is like that fear of speaking um up and just mm -hmm. speaking out or not having means to speak because of the censorship so the language comes out in other different forms um so i think that, I, I pulled this trying, from your... <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it always i think some my work is mostly always like i don't work with sound um mm -hmm. but language is always there um in different forms and shapes um and, and sometimes mentioned... yeah and sometimes i take it uh from like language um from public spaces back mm -hmm. at home so it's like trying to preserve something that people were trying to say yeah. yeah and you've you've mentioned how um also fear appears in where the work takes place like the oh, work yeah. that you're doing here versus if you were still back in russia right definitely yeah i think uh, just what shape the work takes also kind of is dictated by fear what i'm um i have like a privilege of being safe here so I can do whatever I want versus the artists who are still back at home um for them it would take different forms and shapes and I assume for me if I was not for example if I was not afraid to go back and I was working I went back and was working out of there like what form and shape would it take it probably would be something very different mm -hmm. thank you guys um so we're gonna move to ideas about generational and cultural preservation, even though we've touched a bit on them so far. Um, Shabnan, these are some older drawings, but again, using kind of developing what you wanted to do with pattern, I think probably started with, with these earlier series. Um, specifically, you were thinking about patterns here relating directly to the duality of women's experience um, back at home in Iran, uh, thinking about like the hair uh, interchanging with the hijab. Can you speak about um, how you think about pattern in regard to the culture, cultural preservation um, and, and women's experience? Um, yeah, I, in my work, uh, in some of my work, I incorporate these elements like Islamic pattern, 
um, borrowing them from those uh, Islamic tight, uh, tiles, um, which can be seen as a form of uh, cultural per, uh, preservation. So sometimes these patterns represent uh, both the girl's hair and the hijab highlighting the duality and complexity of uh, cultural identity, especially concerning the hijab in um, Iranian society. By using these patterns in my art, I aim to keep my cultural heritage uh, alive and uh, engage in it dialogue about the impact of cultural and societal norms on women's lives. Yeah, and we'll also get more into depth, um, I think, about your ideas about creating safe spaces for women, but I feel that also conversation starts with ideas about the hijab and the use of your patterns as a protective device, um, but we'll we'll get into that um, later on. Um, in the meantime, Zara, um, can you talk in more detail about how you think through, you know, the history of Persian miniatures and your hand in the current paintings um, and the fact that these are abstract paintings and how you think about abstraction um, in regard to preservation? Sure. Um, so I think to just to paint abstractly um, in this day and age is kind of um, archaic. So in and of itself, it's an act of preservation. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I mean, some would argue abstraction kind of reached its um, demise and end. Um, but I think abstraction isn't necessarily something that's from the West. It's always been seen as something being very Western European or or mm -hmm. from like out of the United States from the abstract expressionist movement. Um, but it's something, the, the repetitiveness of abstraction is something that you've seen a lot of Islamic or Jewish architecture. Um, and just the whole idea of kind of repeating things. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, in, in those traditions, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not a very religious person, but in Islamic architecture, for example, or a Jewish architecture, it was done so that you would kind of become closer to God and not be an idol worshiper. Um, so there's that, but um, I guess, what is the, the my approach in these is I painted borders um around them kind of to signify them as something that needs to be preserved um and again these are um they're 48 inches in height and 36 in width um so they're they're a little bit larger in terms of how detail oriented I am in them um so the borders were kind of made to, as a way of kind of um, drawing attention to what's on the inside. Um, and I guess to me, my the horizontal lines are always kind of text for me. Um, and you're you're still using a like a one or two hair brush <laughs> while you're I doing these. Really, I, I'm <laughs> a little bit of... obsessive. Um, <laughs> I think I was like the child that always was told to work within the lines and I really took it literally. Um, <laughs> for I the used, rest I of your life. Small brushes. <laughs> no one's gonna catch <laughs> you off guard. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I um I have to wear I have like 20-20 vision. Um, but I, I wear like reading glasses to magnify what I'm doing and I use like size one or zero um brushes and I'm constantly reworking them because I do I want it to look like it was done uh, digitally, but then if you look at them um more closely, you see like irregularity a little bit. And I think that is also kind of that kind of also goes back to the Persian rug, um, where I think in Iran, they're very proud that the rugs are made by hand as opposed to being machine made. Um, and I think it's just, or even like with the bare bare rugs and because of that, they're they're not quite perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the irregularities are maybe clearer in this image here. Yeah, like so, yeah, I, I mean, I have like um, the lines and then you see some drips and every once in a while my hand is um, shaky and there are parts that are blurred um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, Hannah, you have some interesting ideas about preservation. Um, first of all, you don't always take the stance that things need to be preserved <laughs> um, in your thinking. Can you, can you walk us through how you think about preservation um, when you're making decisions in the studio and in a cultural sense, what that means for you? Yeah. Uh... 
a lot of my work is kind of questioning, yeah, what needs to be preserved and where there's room for change. And specifically when it comes to traditions, my own family has secularized, modernized, and a lot of the way we keep tradition alive is by modernizing tradition and by kind mm -hmm. of just rejecting certain ones, adopting new ones. Uh, and I've kind of come to see recipes as a set of instructions for preserving culture. So mm -hmm. I've worked with this specific recipe a lot, kind of one of those, why am I obsessed with this? But I am. And I've revisited this over and over because it's another one of those intergenerational connections, I guess. And this is something my my grandma used to make. Um, and I don't even think the recipe is hers. I think it came from some random cookbook and she just says it's hers. <laughs> but this work also kind of adds in a little humor too so the parts of the text that look more handwritten as opposed to type is supposed to be my mother's commentary on my grandmother's recipe and she's always like don't use as much sugar don't use as much butter <laughs> like we we make it healthier um so it's yeah it's connection it's humor and change uh mm -hmm. but still really sticking to tradition through cooking the same food every year on the same holiday. Mm -hmm. And this piece is in the show, but um, you see that kind of late motif of the recipe. And this is the same recipe, right? In this older work of yours. Yeah, or it's the same recipe uh, inscribed on commandment tablets. So uh, uh, very literal instructions for <laughs> a secular person to <laughs> be Jewish in a way. I love it. Thank you. Um, Elena, can you speak a bit about preservation via, um, your idea around objects, like archiving objects, you touched on it a little bit, um, and the, the personal, the idea of the personal archive. Yeah, kind of I, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of trying to, um, touch upon the idea of this, like, uh, maybe larger preservation uh, conversation through collecting archiving per personal objects um and like in this case it's an older work but um the the letters these are copies of them but these were the letters that um i didn't know him but supposedly my grandfather sent to my grandmother and then she was they never ended up together but um she was keeping them for whatever reason there was a whole suitcase of the others and I used copies I still have the originals but I used copies of the letters in this work so sometimes it's literally personal object of somebody of people in my family um sometimes it's texts that I save sometimes it can be something that I find or family photos or um news because I work with like what media and propaganda a lot also so kind mm -hmm. of juxtaposing that personal narrative with could use um and, and uh yeah i i was i was thinking i recently came across um a lebanese actor and artist um uh, rabbi Amroe, and in his performance he was saying that how he has this archive that relates only to him because he also was talking about collecting and moving with a lot of personal object object as refuge mm -hmm. and um and I was thinking, oh, I kind of have this archive of little things that I'm moving also from country to country, but that doesn't make sense uh, mm -hmm. to anybody else. You're not a hoarder. You're an archiver. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe if it fits in a, in a certain size suitcase, maybe you're not a hoarder. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marielle. Um, can you talk through your ideas about generational inheritance, um, specifically of fear? We can start kind of trickling that into the conversation. Um, but but things that are preserved, um, whether that's emotional history that ends up coming down the pipeline generationally. Oh, are you, you might be muted. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. You're uh, muted. Okay. There you go. Now I can hear you. <laughs> um, so my parents uh, grew up under the communist regime, uh, which was like a dictatorship. Uh, and 
in Albania. Right? Albania. Um, sorry. And uh, uh, I, under surveillance or individuality was kind of like suppressed and like definitely things like, you know, things that I deal with, like neurodivergence and like mm -hmm. transness, definitely those things were not like a thing in, um, in Albania. And so um, that kind of like, um, like going with the homogeny that that regime kind of forced on people um, uh, and that like identity suppression was something that, you know, it kind of like, there's kind of like a lack of, um, of like language for like identity and like the self that I, um, that I feel like would be in a lot of homes, but I didn't grow up with, um, or yeah, I feel like it's a very general statement, but um, yeah, I, so I kind of like want to preserve like the self because I've in, in, within a, a system, um, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, is there anything you would want to mention about this piece? Because I know this piece is a little more um, speaking to ideas of between, like communicating between generations, um, even just generally ideas about the piece. Yeah, um, I mean, this piece was kind of about uh, my mom and, or the relationship I have with my mom. So. Um, I wanted to use these objects, which are abstracted here, but one of the uh, leftmost objects uh, is supposed to resemble a plant, um, like a household plant, and um, the rightmost object um, is kind of a, a danger sign, uh, and they're connected by this umbilical cord. Um, and I kind of wanted, you know, wanted to treat them like these like household objects these like kind of innocuous like inanimate objects like in a domestic space to kind of reflect mm -hmm. um that suppression that i feel like i've inherited um and i'm currently trying to like find the language to deal with mm -hmm. and using these innocuous um like everyday objects like you said that it's kind of a mode of speaking still suppress. <laughs> I don't know. It's a way of like, of whispering, if that makes yeah. sense. It's yeah. more of a whisper, right? Until you kind of work things out. In the meantime, it's a way of, of stating things, but, but in a whisper, I'm reading it as. Yeah. Um, kind of like using like what, I'm like immediately familiar with to mm -hmm. I'm interested in using like what I'm like um, what's like immediately around rather than like um delving for some kind of symbol or like motif or something mm -hmm. um to about uh to to talk about those things yeah yeah um something that doesn't relate to you. instead it's of the daily life mm -hmm. yeah um. um so cynthia can you talk a little bit about um well you've talked about your ideas about air <laughs> um and preservation and and space around the body um but your ideas about throwaway culture and like pr preservation as it relates to culture in that sense in a more contemporary way than what we've been discussing so far well so the piece on the left is sort of a long-term project that i've been working on um it's cast from an actual packing peanut but it i used a a two-part urethane material that expands in water in a predictable way and made a series of expansions so it's like 11 inches long so they're sort of monstrously expanded um and then on the right is the 
uh, bubble wrap that is cast, the bubbles are cast in plaster and then mounted onto the plaster wall um, so that the wall becomes kind of the substrate that the bubbles exist on and mm -hmm. the space, the architectural space becomes part and an, a part of the um material itself so the wall is is the substrate of the bubble wrap that is connected to the pieces um but in terms of preservation so on the left these pieces because uh they became really technical which kind of gotten me bogged down at this point um for me they're very much monuments um and mm -hmm. as i think i said the sort of trajectory of packaging has moved away from material solidity like packing peanuts more toward the containment of air um so it seems like there's this recognition that you have to use less to keep to make the space safe um mm. but because the pack probably all the packing peanuts that have ever been produced still exist in some way or another even if they're broken down into smaller pieces that space has still been taken up and so in some ways there is a monumental aspect to that mm -hmm. um and that's really interesting to me because they are such an ignored and throwaway object and the spaces that they inhabit only mean something for a very short time and then they are reviled as something to be sort of dealt with mm -hmm. um but i also just find them to be really interesting objects so uh, I feel like they speak to an understanding of what it means to preserve something um, yeah. and sort of a growing recognition that 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 starts a ripple effect um, that just can't be ignored. Yeah, absolutely. They still are taking up space no matter exactly. how yeah. invaluable we consider them to be. <laughs> well, and they're kind of like a sign. I mean, you know, everybody knows what bubble wrap is. And if you see bubble wrap made out of plaster that's mounted on a plaster wall, like what's, you know, that means something because of what we know about those materials and how we've used them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jen, can you speak about um, your ideas of preservation, but um, in a cultural sense, you're, you've talked about it in terms of, um, I would classify as like who the things get preserved for and ideas of class and education status and all that. Um, can you speak to that if I'm um, understanding it correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think a lot about, um, I, I come from pretty extreme poverty and from a long lineage of like uneducated people. Um, I was the first in my family in this country to be able to attend college. My parents didn't, um, graduate high school. Right. So, um, it's really interesting, um, to know that, you know, from a very young age that you were basically born and bred and educated to be a laborer, right? To uh, trade your body and trade your work for the benefit of, of other people. Um, and when I started to go to college and really started to get into the arts, it's really kind of interesting um, kind of like tension or vibration with, you um, looking at the type of art I was making and thinking about the type of work I should be making from other people's perspective. Um, 
and I, and I love my education and I cherish my education. Um, but one of the things I felt like I had to kind of hide was, was coming from poverty and the materials that I used and the imagery that I used for a really long time. And I, I feel like it's something that I am actively taking control of in my practice now, um, and working to kind of figure out how I can start to talk about that in my work. Um, so the idea of like, preservation um kind of like who who gets to benefit from the idea of preservation and also just figuring out or thinking about um kind of the the culture around like what deserves to be preserved um I think a lot about like again going back to the lucky charms like the replacement of labor and labor and labor over and over and over again um and how, how like preserving generational labor is like a thing in, in, um, impoverished communities, like the language that you have is the language of your labor. Um, and that labor on display is what, you know, what makes you an individual, what you have to trade and what you have to offer. Um, so I, think a lot about how poverty kind of rewires the brain and how you can sit in this spot of fight and flight for, you know, for a lifetime act, you know, honestly, um, and kind of what that means in, in this culture and in this country and growing up that way. Um, so this is kind of a, kind of another like strange dual object. Um, this entire keyboard is, um, is one white tail deer. Uh, that was processed over very, very long periods of time. Um, and it does have some silk screening and some rubber um, on the back of it. But again, thinking about this idea of like coming to the same situation, repeating the same moment over and giving um, your energy away, uh, what that looks like and how that's like so easily replaceable um, is something that I focus on like quite a bit in my work. Um, so there's this idea of like the constant fight or flight being the deer and the the keyboard, right? The keyboard that is like always on the brink of being obsolete and is designed in a way that it kind of knows or perceives its own death. You know, when you design tech objects, um, there's this idea that it's going to be upgraded or uh, mm -hmm. changed in a certain way. And as a designer, you think about these things, right? Like it's inherently embedded into the object. Um, yeah. So I work well, a lot. I automatically with... thought about the cubicle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Seeing exactly. I... And this type of um, beige. <laughs> thought about yep. like the <laughs> 80s, 90s cubicle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like this idea of like this stacking office equipment and this stacking energy and all of this like kind of stacked frazzledness, um, you know, mm -hmm. kind of compounding itself into an object is basically what I've been thinking like a lot about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we were also going to talk about kind of beacons of warning, um, which I guess is a force that goes in opposition um, to fear. So we'll go through these a little quicker because we're getting close to time. But um, so what I'm curious about in this section is modes of communicating with the viewer in regard to the heaviness of, of fear as a topic. Like, how do you go about that um, in a material sense? So Cynthia, maybe you can start us off. Like, I know you find these materials very funny. <laughs> And that plays into the work quite a bit, right? Well, so so these in particular, I found um, in a bundle right after the city had experienced sort of the after effects of a hurricane. And um, I was really excited because they're particularly chunky. Like I carried them back to the apartment. They were very re rectilinear. And then I opened up the bundle of them and they were waterlogged from the hurricane. And I was initially horrified, but then I realized that it was sort of like just something I was going to have to go with. Um, and so I just responded to, I mean, they, they also smelled really horrible. They kind of still do, <laughs> um, which I find sort of entertaining. Um, but I, I just sort of, 
let them be what they wanted to be. Um, I mean, I, I feel really sad for them, which is, seems ridiculous. Um, but I, I generally apply that to most of the packaging I find because I feel like it has completed this really noble, um, errand. And then it is just abandoned on the sidewalk. Um, as if it didn't sacrifice itself to bring you something that you held dear or actually valued. Um, and so I, I, you know, I appreciate like the idea of elevating them from this pile of waterlogged garbage on the sidewalk to this sort of you know these pieces inhabit the space of the figure like they participate mm -hmm. in a conversation with bodies and the only difference between them being that garbage on the sidewalk and being these sort of evocative things in this space is that we intersected at this particular space and time and I decided to kind of see something in them that most other people wouldn't recognize um yeah and, and the you've mentioned in the past like the humor in that act of elevating them right like well elevate. and also like both <laughs> on the left like working with translucent porcelain and glass casting both of those materials are incredibly craft based mm -hmm. and and uh labor intensive and I really love working like that I'm obsessed with process um and the piece on the right that large panel of honeycomb board which required to be picked cell by cell with a pair of tweezers just like dedicating that amount of time and effort to a space that was produced to transit something that i don't even know what it was to somebody mm -hmm. that i don't know um you know i i i like the sort of irony of that and um making the invisible almost visible but not very yeah yeah thank you um hannah you think about humor in delivering um in the delivery of your work quite a bit um but for you it's got a really cultural basis is that right yeah um i think i, I do work a lot with food also and I would say food and humor are like the quintessentially American Jewish uh, qualities. <laughs> and I know like a lot of humor has evolved out of dealing with trauma, but I feel like for me, it's just a natural tendency. Mm -hmm. And I find the stories I'm telling funny. I find mm -hmm. it funny that we do certain things and not others. Um, like, you know, Jews are not supposed to get tattoos. I have a Hebrew tattoo <laughs> and I don't dress modestly, but I wear my Jewish star and other jewelry. And uh, just thinking about how funny what we call a la carte Judaism is, like picking and choosing <laughs> what kind of culture you're gonna keep. <laughs> um, and then the piece on the right is, I feel like both to me are also kind of like Jewish femininity, which... I mean, you can talk about Funny Girl uh, and, you know, Barbara Streisand and just like the, the the funny Jewish woman trope, which I actually love. So, <laughs> and I do identify with it. And I think about, um, yeah, how, so I, I call the right one lunch at Softas, which means grandmother. Uh, so I just, yeah, think about my, every time I actually go both to both of my grandmother's homes now, they always have like old costume jewelry for me. So oh, tuna salad and, and jewelry. <laughs> do you wear the jewelry with your tattoo? <laughs> I actually do. I do wear a lot of the jewelry. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Shabnam, can you, um, so though humor isn't your usual delivery method, instead, I feel you using comfort, um, like using these patterns and color scapes um, as a mode of comfort, right? So I've heard you talk in the past about how you really, you're creating safe spaces for these figures, um, specifically women. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so yeah, because like we are a lot around these kind of like patterns and carpet and colors. So like uh, letting, like having those kind of colors and patterns and like maybe like those miniature uh, paintings in my work uh, just gives this idea of like this uh, alternate uh, reality um, that give this uh, kind of comfort uh, to these uh, women. So in my work, I discuss the restrictive patriarchal society uh, in my home, Iran, where women face censorship, limitation on their mobility and the obligation to wear a hijab. Um, I recount a disturbing incident uh, involving the killing or arresting women in Iran due to their uh, choice of clothing. Uh, this experience and the broader societal con context of fear and oppression faced by women in Iran influenced my, my art a lot and my life. And uh, so by uh, in incorporating Islamic pattern in some of my work and Persian carpet motifs, I use these elements to address the challenge. Uh, the fears and constraints imposed on women in my culture by creating uh, spaces where women can exist freely. Uh, I try to confront the fear in inducing aspect of patriarchal no norms and censorship. Um, my art serves as a platform for expressing these exp experiences, uh, engaging with fear uh, uh, women face in Iranian society. And and part of the delivery, although you're you're creating a safe space for them, you're also engaging. You're you're giving such power to the female figures with specifically the use of a direct gaze you've talked about in the past. Yes, uh, so um, yeah, gay, uh, I use the gaze as a tactic uh, uh, to influence the viewer's engagement with the, uh, with my paintings. Uh, so some figures in my paintings uh, confront the viewer directly with a direct gaze while others avert their uh, eyes or lower their gaze. So. Uh, this intentional variation in the gaze of the figure serves to uh, slow down the viewer's interaction um, uh, with the artwork. The direct gaze uh, of uh, these uh, young uh, women, uh, for example, inviting the viewers to engage more deeply with this, uh, with their empowering presence, challenging established hierarchies. Uh, in uh, contrast, the lowered gaze of uh, the father um, or the man in that painting uh, uh, or even the distant uh, gaze of the grandmother um, and the observer's gaze through the camera create this uh, different pace prompting reflection on the power dynamic within the scene. Uh, so, yeah, Thank like, you. Yeah. Sorry. um, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Annika, can you, um, speak to us just, uh, very briefly, because we're coming to the end now, um, uh, about the, the sense of humor and, um, like, um, 
humor and repulsion that is part of the story of this piece and how that acts as a protective force. I, I really like the tension between <clears throat> attraction and repulsion and fear and fun and like sexy and gross. <laughs> I think there's like something really fascinating in that middle point on this mm -hmm. piece. I was reading the story um, called Donkey Skin or All for, depending on the version. And it's about this princess whose dad wants to marry her. And he, she makes this pelt to make herself basically like hideous and in order to avoid uh, horrible advances from her father. Um, and I, like I and at the same time, Brett Kavanaugh was being sworn into the uh, Supreme court and I just like the parallel between those two stories was really bizarre to me and um I like to think about how these fairy tales are still in our culture today and how they are fun and scary and beautiful and ugly uh, and this piece I'm trying to get to that middle point like it's it's all stitched together to resemble scarring it's gold and glittery and beautiful but then like also sweaty and kind of like uh, misused looking um also some people thought question. it was kind of like uh dried blood a yeah dried blood too potentially um uh, also i'm throwing in one of your escape series butts because you're talking about intersection of of sexy so <laughs> <laughs> Part of yeah, the series. butt is many things. The butt is <laughs> like <laughs> sexy things. and like you know gross and um uh but also funny and vulnerable and powerful. It's it's it encompasses a lot of things. Um, so we're maybe at the end of our time, I believe. Um, so I think we'll wrap at this point. If there are any questions, please add them into the chat. We might have time for a couple quick ones. Um, I'll go to the end. We had some more pieces, but um, I'll just end on this install shot. Um, does anyone have any quick questions for the artists? Can be about... Um, works um about their larger practice or works in the show while people are maybe um adding questions in i'll just remind folks that um the next show we will have in the space is um going to be a solo exhibition by margaret pinto it will also be at map space um the reception is on december 2nd um can I also just give a minute to each of the artists while in case there are any questions? Um, do you guys have shows coming up or anything exciting that people should look out for? Um, mind you, all the artists' websites are linked um, and you can find their Instagrams in our posts. Um, any of you got anything to announce that we should keep on our calendars? Cynthia, oh. your first time I am. <laughs> Nothing come up. I, I preface that question with studio time is very important and shouldn't be undervalued. Um, Shabna. <laughs> so I do have a, a two-person show this coming April on Nars Foundation Space. Uh, awesome. That uh, yeah, so that I uh, I will uh. Yeah, I will come up with the details on my Instagram or my website too. But yeah. Congrats, Shavna. Thank you. Anybody else have announcements? Well, Jen, you have another show currently up, right? It just opened in Brooklyn. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was like racking my brain. I'm like, I feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> Too many things going on. Too many shows. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a couple of pieces, um, a couple of like trick coins and um, some knives that are bent in the round at a show called Anthro Shift in Dumbo. 
Um, mm. that's really fantastic. There's some really great works there. Uh, group show. Um, I'm I'm building a robot with an engineering team that moves that's, like a deer. It's a long chair. It'll be out in like a year. <laughs> We will keep an eye out for that. <laughs> Anybody else have updates? Um, I am also adding into the chat for everyone the website for the exhibition since we did not get a chance to look at every single piece by the artists that are in the show. Um, you can find all the individual pieces on the website. Really, this was most importantly, we wanted to give a little bit of a window into everyone's practice. Um, but you can check out the specific pieces on the site and on our Instagram, it's all over the place. Um, last chance for questions. Otherwise, I will hand it back to Patricia. I don't see any Thank questions you. in the chat. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we, I think you guys have done a great job of um, giving some insights into your practice. And it's always fascinating to hear how artists are thinking about the things they're making. And um, I'm really excited about this show and always, it's always sad to see a show disappear, but we have another week because it's like a world that Brigadoon, you know, it, it, it comes to life and then, and then disappears. Uh, it's been really amazing to have all of you. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you'll all stay in touch and we'll make sure to put, I don't think I have all website links on the website, but mm. I will make sure that those are up in the next um, day or so. So you can see more information. And there's also a shop if you want to um, purchase any of this amazing work from these uh, incredible up and coming um, and established artists. So thank you all. Yeah, preserve the artist by the work. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Artists, we gotta support. We gotta support the peeps. <laughs> so thank you all so much. It's been great to hear you speak about your work. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful night. This recording will be up on the YouTubes um, for both spaces. Um, and bits will be on Instagram because everything is. Have a wonderful <laughs> night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.